Today we're going to look at the legend of King Arthur. Well, first we need to figure out what is a legend. Well, a legend is a story purported to be historical in nature, but without any proof. For example, our story of King Arthur, or our story of Robin Hood. Now, where evidence of the existence of these actual historical figures exists, figures like King Arthur are legends due in large part to the many stories that have been created about them. So who was he? Well, he's the figure at the heart of Arthurian legends. He's said to be the son of Uther Pendragon and Ygraine of Cornwall. And he's also been presented as a near-mythic figure in Celtic stories, and in early Latin chronicles, he's known as a military leader. In later romance stories about King Arthur, he's presented as a king and an emperor. Now, Arthur was most famous for designing an order of the best knights in the world. But did King Arthur really exist? Some modern scholars believe that there was an actual person at the heart of the legends, though not necessarily a king with a band of knights in shining armor. Now, if there is a historical basis to the character, he would have gained fame as a warrior battling the Germanic invaders in the late 5th and early 6th centuries. So it is the Arthur of the late Middle Ages who has most captured the imagination. But what is important about this legendary figure is Arthur's influence on literature, art, music, and society from the Middle Ages to the present. There are other important people from the legends with King Arthur as well. For example, Merlin. Merlin was Arthur's, Arthur's advisor, prophet, and magician, and he foretold much of what would happen to Arthur. We also have Guinevere, the wife of King Arthur. She's beautiful and she is very desirable. She was either forced into a green or an extramarital relationship with Lancelot, and then afterwards was condemned. We also have Morgan Le Fay, Arthur's half-sister and an adversary. She is usually portrayed as a wicked enchantress, and she plotted with her lover to steal Arthur's sword, the Excalibur. We also have Mordred, Arthur's nephew. Now, as an adult, Mordred became one of Arthur's knights. When Arthur went to fight Lancelot over Guinevere, he left Mordred as regent in his absence. Now, Mordred proclaimed Arthur as dead and went on to try and claim the throne. So Arthur had to return. There are also items of tradition that go along with the stories of King Arthur. For example, his sword, the Excalibur. Now, it's the sword given to Arthur by the Lady of the Lake. After Arthur's last battle, he made one of his knights return it to the water, where it was grasped by a hand and drawn under. Its scabbard also prevented the wearer from losing blood. We also have King Arthur's quest for the Holy Grail. Now, the Holy Grail is considered to be the cup from which Christ drank at the Last Supper. It was used by Joseph of Arimathea to collect Christ's blood and sweat while Joseph tended him on the cross. And at the court of King Arthur, it was prophesied that the Grail would one day be rediscovered by the best knight in the land, so the knights of the Round Table traveled far and wide searching for it. Well, what was the round table? That was the large table at which Arthur's knights met to tell of their deeds and from which they set forth in search of further adventures. The table was said to have seated 50 knights and its shape suggested equality among the knights who sat there. However, accounts differ about the origin of the round table.
So how do we look at the legend of King Arthur and his rise to fame and power? Well, starting as a boy, Arthur was raised by Merlin. And we find a sword was placed in a stone and, be, and we're told whoever drew it out would be king. So Arthur was supposed to be helping out another knight and he was supposed to find the knight's sword and he did not know where it was. So when he found this sword in a stone, he grabbed onto it and pulled it out with the intent of giving it to another knight. He had no idea of the legend that whoever drew it out would be king, but once he was told, he was crowned king. Now this led to a rebellion in which Arthur managed a victory through strategy and bravery, though the odds were against him. Next, King Arthur married Guinevere, whose father gave Arthur the Round Table as a dowry. And the Round Table became the place where Arthur's knights sat, and a magnificent reign for Arthur followed. Now, as we start looking at the adventures of the Knights of the Round Table, we start off with the quest of the Holy Grail and the love affair between Queen Guinevere and the best knight, Lancelot. So, of course, once this is found out, Lancelot fled and Guinevere was sentenced to death. But Lancelot then rescues her and takes her to his realm. Of course, Arthur followed, making war on his former knight and leaving Mordred in charge. That was the wrong person to leave in charge because Mordred rebelled and Arthur had to return to regain his crown. Now, on the last battle of Salisbury Plain, Arthur slews his nephew Mordred, but he was gravely wounded himself. And so Arthur is carried off on a barge, and his body is never found. So when we look at the Knights of the Round Table, Arthur's most famous for designing an order of the best knights of the world. So people who belong at the Knights of the Round Table are men of courage, honor, dignity, courtesy, and nobleness. They protected ladies and damsels, honored and fought for kings, and undertook dangerous quests. Logris was the Arthurian realm of virtue, the spiritual counterpart of Arthur's material kingdom, which was Britain. Now, the only vulnerable from within, there was dissent and treachery in Arthur's own court. Now, according to Sir Thomas Mallory, an English author and compiler of The Legend of King Arthur, the code of these knights was the following. To never do outrage nor murder. Always to flee treason. To by no means be cruel, but to give mercy unto him who asks mercy. To always help or aid ladies, gentlewomen, and widows. To never force ladies, gentlemen, or widows. And not to take up battles and wrongful quarrels for love or for worldly goods. Now we take a look at the knights and King Arthur in the sense of being a hero. The knights fight for abstract principles of justice, honor, and purity. As we said, they weren't fighting for material goods or for land. And they also then have serious flaws. Just like non-heroic non types, you're going to see as humans, they have pride, they have lust, and they have vengefulness. But for the most part, they rise above their faults in their contribution to Logris. And as we go through the adventures, each knight is then tested for his weaknesses. Now these assorted legends and tales carry a valuable insight. A man's self-respect does not depend upon external qualities. It doesn't depend upon his wealth, his position, his physical strength, or his size. Instead, it depends upon his private integrity and his valor as a knight. Now, the emblem of the Knights of the Round Table worn around the necks of all the knights was given to them by King Arthur as part of a ceremony of their being made a Knight of the Round Table. The order's dominant idea was the love of God, of men, and of noble deeds.
So this is the emblem. So part of it is the cross, to remind them that they were to live pure and stainless lives and to strive after perfection and thus attain the Holy Grail. The red dragon was the symbol of King Arthur himself. It represented their allegiance to the king. And of course, he's standing on the round table. It symbolized the eternity of God and the equality, unity, and comradeship of the order and the singleness of purpose of all of the knights. We'll also look at a knight's code of chivalry. So we have prowess. You should seek excellence in everything you do. There's also the code of justice, to seek always the path of right, unencumbered by personal interest. There's also the code of loyalty, to be known for unwavering commitment to your ideas and your friends. And then largesse, be generous in so far as your resources allow. There's also the sense of courage, often means choosing the more difficult path. And, of course, these are knights, so they have the code of nobility, to show your character by holding to the virtues and the duties of a knight. And the code of humility, value first the contributions of others, do not boast. And probably the most important knight's code of chivalry is defense, defend your country, your family, your friends, and those who can't defend themselves. Well, that'll do about the Knights and King Arthur. If you want to learn more about King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, please let me know in the comments what more you'd like to learn about. And as always, I appreciate it if you subscribe.